Welcome everyone to my presentation called uh, Async Fun and some Monix bits. So my name is Tomasz Kogut. Uh, I'm based here in Warsaw. Uh, I've been doing Scala since about 2011. Uh, I work at the company Adform. Uh, please excuse me, I'll do a little bit of self-promotion <laughs> for my company. Uh, so Adform is a Danish company with over 15, 18 offices around the world. We're in the ad tech business. Uh, what we do is we build our own platform for, for publishers and advertisers. And uh, the technical challenges of every day is big data, like vast amounts of data to process, uh, very fast services like few millions requests per second, and uh, machine learning for outsmarting our, comp our competition. Um, I think that's enough of self-promotion. So um, we're of course hiring, so if this sound a bit interesting for you, so this is my handle. Uh, you can try to contact me or we can talk after the presentation. Okay, so uh, this presentation is split into three parts. So uh, the first part is actually, uh, I will try to define some terms because everyone is talking about asynchrony in Scala, parallel programming and other things like that. But uh, we are not very sharp when we talk about those things. So we'll try to go uh, through a few of those and try to define them. And uh, then we'll look a bit into Scala's future, uh, where it shines and where are problems with the Scala's future. And we'll look uh, a bit under the hood how it's constructed. And at the end, I will show you some uh, code examples from Monix, how Monix can help you overcome some of the limitations that future gives us. Okay, so um, those are the terms I would like to discuss with you now, um, because I guess everyone is using those, those uh, probably everyday work, and uh, it's probably fine not to know exactly what it means, but for the need of this presentation, I want everyone to be on the same page. So we'll go one by one and try to uh, talk a little bit about this. Okay, so let's assume that the time flows this way, right? So we have some, some application. It doesn't really matter which, what does this application do. Uh, the, little check, the little box, this might be, I don't know, time slices of your processor or function calls, whatever. This really doesn't matter right now. And uh, let's say you want to do something aside from the main execution line of your process. So this is exactly uh, what we would call asynchronous processing. So Asynchronous processing is about doing something outside of the main loop. So um, the, the process that is, the code that is executing aside can return some value to you. Uh, it may not return a value. So we are not talking now about time and about execution on processors, anything. We're just talking about uh, the fact that something happens outside of the main function. Now, um, the other thing is multi-threading and single-threading. Single so as probably all of you know, um, our, our programs run inside processes, right? They are scheduled by the operating system. And multi-threading is about the fact if the process that is running on your operating system can have multiple threads inside of it. So this is more about how the underlying platform works than about the time and uh, about the execution. So again, we are not yet talking about if the things are happening in parallel or not. It's only about how the process is organized in operating system. So uh, I would probably say that multi-threading is kind of like a more specialized thing than the asynchronous processing. Like you could say that uh, multi-threading is actually like extends asynchronous processing. Okay, now about concurrency. So what is concurrency? Um, so concurrency is uh, actually about algorithms. So if you have some program and you can uh, find some smaller chunks of your program that can actually be executed and reordered at will, then we're talking about concurrency. So again, this has nothing to do with time. 
this has nothing to do with the underlying uh, hardware platform. It's only about if your program can be decoupled into smaller pieces and if those pieces can be re rearranged and if the ordering is not, not relevant. Okay, and the, the final thing, so parallelism. So when we talk about parallel processing, this is actually, you need to process things in the same physical time. So this is about the physical time, that things are happening at the same time. And um, if you have a single call machine, you cannot have parallel processing, right? Because only one, one, uh, one part of the program can be executed at one time. So to recap things, so we have asynchronous processing. Uh, it's about happening uh, things on the side. We have multi-threading and single threading. So this is about the, how the process is organized inside. Does it have some thread? Uh, concurrency is about algorithms and ordering things inside. And parallelism is about physical time and happening at the same time. There is also, you, you can also uh, find in literature some some definition of parallelism on the hardware level, like for example, uh, the bits on, in the registers are set at once, right? So, but this is this is not very relevant to this presentation. Just wanted to put it here because uh, why not? Okay, so from all of these terms, the asynchronous definition is probably the most general one because we are not telling anything about the underlying platform. We are not telling anything about how the trading unit works. And we are not talking about time at all. We are just saying that something will be processed outside of the main loop. And so since this is a Scala meetup, we would probably want to see how to do asynchronous processing um, in Scala. So we'll try to define a type that will allow us to do this asynchronous processing. So we have some uh, needs that would be, uh, we want also to handle errors. We want to uh, have an option to return the result to us from this asynchronous processing. And of course, use type safe constructs. What we don't want to is what I said. We don't want to say anything about parallelism, about uh, concurrency. So this will leave out for the second. So basically, what we want to be able to do is to, def to be able to define something, some, some method called, let's say, it compute. And what this says is that compute returns something that, is, that will be computed outside the main loop. And it has this possibility of returning an object of type A back to you. So um, I will catch the chase and just, uh, so this is, this is the most general um, asynchronous definition. This is the most general definition of asynchronous processing you can find in, on the internet in the literature. So um, I know this looks ugly. You have two, two functions, you have two units, but asynchronous processing is actually ugly. So um, it might be easier to digest it if you would look at it this way. So the asynchronous processing is actually a function that takes as an argument a callback so the callback is the, how the result will be returned to you. And it doesn't return anything because this just happens on the side, right? And uh, we have this try inside callback because we want to handle errors. And this is just the usual way in Scala how to do that. So how to use this type? <coughs> so um, let's say we have something called a division service. So this service takes an argument, this is an int. And it returns this asynchronous computation that would eventually return an int to you. So this CB is, is the CB here is actually this, right? So CB is a function that takes, that takes a um, try and returns nothing, right? So this is exactly what we do here. We take the argument that was passed to us, we division 22 by this argument, put it inside try, and call the callback to return the result back to the caller. Um, how to use this like in practice? So you just need to pass in the callback. So for example, uh, you can pass in the print line. So this will, this will actually uh, divide 42 and the 22 by 40, 44 and uh, just print out the success with zero probably because we're doing a division on int. Of course, we can get some uh, more profound usage of the asynchronous. For example, we could supply oxygen to astronauts 
So um, we can call this division service to compute the uh, amount of oxygen we need to pass. And if it successes, then the oxygen is passed. If not, then the error is uh, thrown. OK, so uh, as I said, we had this um, definition of asynchronous processing as a type. And probably most of you know that actors also uh, can be used for asynchronous processing. So someone can ask, so how does actors fit into that definition, that type definition? Because uh, let's look again at the division service. So the type signature of division service is int to callback of int to unit, right? And uh, the normal signature that you think about actor is n to unit, right? So we're missing a bit, the, we're missing where is the callback part, right? So we don't see anywhere the callback. But if you would try to model the division service on two actors, so let's say this is the division actor service. So we send out the message, and uh, it computes what we, it needs, and it sends back the message, right? So actually, it can send back the, the result. Because the actual type of actor is not any to unit, but it's any and actor ref to unit. Because uh, when you send out a message, you also attach your own identifier, right? So this is the callback that is used inside actors. OK, so um, we define this, what is an asynchronous computation. And uh, the asynchronous computation uh, has a lot of problems. You probably use it a lot of those. And um, you, you might be tempted to find a, the, to write a function that would actually turn this asynchronous computation into a synchronous one. So instead of uh, waiting for the callback, you, you want to get the result at will. This, this is probably uh, something that people try to do when they first try to cope with asynchronous processing. Because um, we are used to programming languages like, like Java and C++ when semicolon is, uh, is ordering the instructions. So if you have a, one expression and another expression and a semicolon between them, right? So you understand that the thing on the left happens before the thing on the right. So uh, some people call it like semicolon-driven development. And uh, well, every time you see something like this, this is a hack. This is, al this is almost al always a hack on, a, on the underlying platform. And this won't scale and won't work. And uh, we can look into it. So the problems with the semicolon programming is that, um, so first thing is the lessons of distributed programming. So for example, if you have a re remote procedure call, well, the other party that you're calling may be not there. So like believing that you will get this A, it's like it, it doesn't make really sense because there might be nobody to answer you. Uh, the other thing is you will kill the parallelism. So you will kill the ability of your program, like we defined parallelism before, to execute in the same time. And we can, we can look at something called Amdahl law that tells us how much we can lose in it. And um, you, your platform that you're executing your program, I mean, your program is executing in some kind of process, right? And like everyone thinks that we have threads, but this, this actually can uh, change because like some, for example, Scala now, if you program in Scala, you believe that you have infinite number of threads or at least a very big one. But then you, if you move with Scala to some other platform outside of JVM, you might have problems. So we'll look into the, the second problem and the third one in detail now. Um, so like a small recap of what is an AMDA law in general. So let's say you have 20 hours of computation to do. And 90 hours of that computation can be paralyzed. And one hour cannot. So it doesn't matter how many calls you put inside your machines. You cannot never go below the one hour because this this one hour cannot be paralyzed. So this is uh, so still you get a 20, 20 times uh, speed up. But if you do the await thing, you lose all of that 
because you need to go with every hour of computation y on one and you lose all of the speed up. The other thing is the execution platform because like we believe that uh, like threads are cheap and this is actually not the matter because for example uh, there are different kind of platforms. For example the JVM platform is one to one kernel threading level so if you create a this is of course in general, like this might differ on, for example, Solaris or something, but in general, if you create a thread in JVM, you get a one thread on the system level, right? And uh, so if you, if you start to block with await, you just waste that thread, and threads are pretty expensive. So you're losing at least in uh, terms of memory and some efficiency. There are other platforms, um, we call the other platforms that have actually <coughs> M logical threads that are mapped into N logical N physical threads in the machine. So um, this model is actually used in, for example, Haskell, Golang, or, or Erlang. So if you program, for example, in Golang and you call a database, then you, you don't return something like a future or something. It looks like you're blocking, but actually the underlying uh, runtime is doing the whole, the whole work for you. So it's fine to block there, but this is, this is only uh, an illusion, actually, because there has to be some way underneath to actually take you off the processor and stuff like that. And um, there, there is also this very popular platform that has uh, M logical threads that are mapped to one physical thread. Does anyone know what this platform is? Yeah, this is JavaScript. And as you know, Scala now runs on JavaScript, right? So when you're blocking, you use await. It might be fine on JVM, but then your code is totally useless on, on uh, Scala.js. OK. Um, OK, so we went through some definitions. We went through some uh, problems with asynchronous. So let's keep on looking into asynchronous processing and uh, another problem with it is that if you start to do asynchronous processing you're going to pollute all of your code with it so it's like a disease it spreads all over your code so for example if you have this like uh, very well behaved functions but blocking functions for example get tweets for a text and get facebook i know feed for some text so to 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 get the total mentions you only need to call all of both of those functions and uh, Add it right now. Let's see what happens when we try to move to this asynchronous processing style. So um, the total mentions was only adding two integers, right? Now, now we need to um, call the tweets function, and inside it, in callback, we need to call the Facebook function, and inside that, we need to check if both are success. If both are success, we need to add it, and then by return by the means of original callback, return it to the caller. So, um, well, it's pretty ugly. And wait for it if your product owner comes to you and says, "Okay, so we got Facebook, Twitter, and now we want Instagram, and then we want Tumblr and Reddit, and then try to I don't know compose all of this in this style. It will get messy very fast." OK, so as you see, asynchronous processing is kind of hard, but uh, this is not, not everything. It's hard and ugly, but when we go to asynchronous processing and we add parallelism to it, then it starts to get really, really messy. So um, let's, let's try to look at this uh, async type. It's simplified because I, don't, I didn't put a try inside, but this doesn't matter. And let's say you want to define this map to function. So what it does, it allows you to put in two asynchronous uh, processing functions and combine them with some third function, right? So now, um, in that previous example, we didn't need to run Twitter and then Facebook. We could run Twitter and Facebook in the same time, right? So we could call Facebook here, Twitter here, and we can just save these results here, right? But now what, what is A and what is B? So A is a var and B is a var. So we have a concurrency. 
right? Because our algorithm doesn't really uh, depend on the ordering of computation. And we have mutable state. So we have concurrent, con concurrently access mutable state. And probably all of you know this is like the, the worst of everything. Um, so to, to, to get things even worse, so uh, we also need to somehow model that the callback is called only once, right? Because we don't know which one will return first. So the callback might be, might be called here or here. So we need to model some kind of um, state machine that we're waiting for x, we're waiting for y. And uh, well, it's a lot of work. It's possible. We need to use um, some synchronization. So for example, we can use logs. But using logs is actually uh, sometimes problematic because the liveness of your, pro of your program will decrease. So you can actually get slower than with, the, than with the version that goes one after another. This highly depends if you're doing I.O. or CPU intensive stuff, but we'll, we'll get to that. But you can get f uh, slower because of this. <laughs> OK. Uh, another thing, let's say we're very stubborn and we're able to actually write this map to function. Cool. So it works. Uh, we execute it in a thousand times. It's concurrent, so the thousand one time it can fail. But let's say we believe it's all fine. Um, at some point in time, you probably will need this kind of function. You probably are using it already from the future object, right? Sequence. So you have a list of asynchronous Proce uh, processing to run, and you want to combine all of them and have the answers in a list to do something with it, right? This is, this is actually very common, because you, you have a lot of asynchronous processing that you want to somehow combine. So um, the problem with this is that uh, if we try to write the sequence function with the map how it was written, how, you, how I shown it before, so we will probably we'll end up with a stack overflow to, sh to visualize a, a, a bit better. So um, let's say we have this asynchronous computation that does nothing but only returns one in a success. So this function doesn't do anything special. And what will happen if we will try to invoke one callback inside another and another and another? So um, we'll. We'll try now in this example to print the stack trace length. So with every uh, callback, the stack trace increases. Now we have here 46. In the sample on the right, there is one, the deep is one, one bigger. And now it's 51. So um, this is a real problem that, well, actually you can take down your application. Um, so how to avoid this problem? So there is something that you can f find in literature called the crossing the asynchronous boundary. So um, now instead of invoking callback on the current thread, you can use this uh, some kind of executor from Java or from Scala, like here, the global executor. And instead of running the function, the callback, you can submit it to the executor and uh, let him do the job. So now the, the, stack, the stack trace length is actually constant. So it, in both of these uh, examples, it's 12. So this helps to avoid. But um, this has its own problems. And now let's, let's move on to the second part. So let's talk a bit about the Scala future. So basically, Scala future is our async type. If you look at it from the perspective of incomplete. Like in, Sca in, in, in Scala, the future, most of the combinators, at least in the pre 2.12 version, were, were written using uh, on complete. Now it's more used, now it's written with the usage of transform and transform with, but this is, this is the same design. It's callback based, and every computation is being submitted to the global execution pool or, or other execution pool that you pass in. The interesting thing is if you, if you read about future, they will tell you that it's for parallel processing. Well, actually not. Future is, uh, future is actually about asynchrony. So the parallelism or, or other properties comes from the execution context. So future can perfectly fine run on the Scala.js platform, where you have a single thread 
and uh, and you you don't have any parallelism at all, right? It's stack safe because, as I said, you're uh, submitting things to the execution context. Um, but there are two problems with this submission to the execution context. So uh, the first one is we're increasing the degree of non-determinism that happens during the computation. And the second thing is uh, performance with the CPU bound task will suffer a lot. So now we'll look into both of these problems. So um, this is a code that's actually a simplified version of something that I wrote like let's say a year ago or something like that. So uh, I had to download some big files from S3 uh, per client. So this CSV file had two gigabytes, for example, right? I had this aggregate function that would take the CSV file and return uh, like aggregated int, so something that is pretty small. It doesn't really matter what it is, it's something pretty small. And I had a, a list of clients I need to do this for. So there were like 100 clients, now it's more like 200 something. So how I approach the problem, so I would take the user list, right? Call the map on it, of course, um, call the download the data, then flat map it to aggregate. Of course, use the sequence, right? That's to, to have a one awaitable object. And I would run something like this in the main, like the process took a few hours, so it was self-assumed to, to, to take it at least eight hours. And can you tell me what is wrong with this code? Why it won't work? And it actually didn't work. It actually failed me on production. I like it was a data pipeline, so nothing very crucial, but still. Yeah? I have a query that all the users start immediately, and each one tries to pull the two gigs and will blow out the heap. Yeah, exactly. This is the problem. You believe exact, exa uh, um, the, the same like in the semicolon processing that after you create this, this map, right? So you, you create this download data, and then you do the flat map and aggregate. And you believe that after downloading the data, uh, the aggregation starts. And this is not true. Because if you look underneath how the future is actually implemented, so if you do flat maps and maps, those, uh, those uh, functions that you pass to map and flat map will be chained together, and then won't be submitted yet. So this operation, map on list, is very fast, right? So we are able to submit 100, right? Because there are 100 clients, tasks of downloading two gigabytes of files. So we'll end up with um, 200 gigabytes in RAM in very short time. Uh, so for the, for the knowing person, here's a book for you. Thanks. And this indeed did fail me in, the, in production, yeah? Uh, e e yes, single single thread executor. <laughs> oh no, no wait, no single thread executor didn't help. No, we had to do it uh, a bit a bit differently. I will show how to actually uh, resolve this problem a bit later. Uh, so again, so if you believe that you're calling a flat map and this function is actually being submitted, it's not being submitted immediately. You need to wait for this to end because futures are being linked together. Okay, so um, so the the problems comes from the fact that every map and flat map operation is jumping on threads. It's actually being submitted to the pool, right? So that was one problem of, of it. The second one is if you're doing some kind of pure data transformation that is CPU bound, you have all the data in RAM and you're doing only transformations, nothing else. So for example, you have one transformation that takes the CSV and creates a matrix, then the matrix is somehow uh, reduced to a vector and then you have the final end. So you can do it in like two ways, right? You can do it like this. So start a computation of downloading the file, then map it, and then map it again. Or you can start one future that will do all the work without being rescheduled, right? And this is actually a lot faster than this one. Why? Because when you're jumping threads, you're losing all the cache locality you have. So 
if, you, if, if the CPU can somehow help you because it has full caches of your data, now if you are submitted, like, like you are rescheduled to another thread, the data, the cache locality is gone and you are a lot slower. And I have some numbers later and uh, I will show them. Let me get to that point. Um, and actually, the funny part is that uh, the authors of future, uh, so probably type safe or Scala authors, are actually very aware of this problem. Uh, if you look into the future implementation, you will find something called internet callback executor. So this executor is, uh, this execution context is uh, what it does. It does two things. It runs on the current thread. You see, the runable is not being submitted anywhere. It's just being run uh, immediately. And the other thing is hidden here, batching executor. It's actually um, taking a few runables and batching it into one single entity that will be executed. So uh, where, where is it used? So for example, the sequence function that we were talking about a bit earlier. So all of this computation, the building of the list is done on your execution context. Oh, sorry, it's here. It's done on your execution context, but the last operation where you have a builder and you are t t saying, OK, from this mutable builder, give me an immutable list, is actually uh, done on this internal callback executor. And all the operations that are uh, done inside Future's own callbacks are done on this executor for the performance reasons. Um, and this is done on the, on the current thread that finished the last, the last operation. Next. Uh, well, the Akka people are also aware of this problem. So you have something in the Akka HTTP project called Fast Future. Funny, isn't it? Uh, so what is Fast Future? It provides an alternative implementation of the basic transformation operations defined on Future, which try to avoid scheduling to execution context if possible. Uh, that is, if the given Future value is already present. So this is a tr real problem if you want to be really fast in processing. Uh, Another thing, like this is a screenshot of a tweet of, that I made a few days ago. Uh, so John is one of the committers to Scala Z. He's working on uh, IO Monet. So IO Monet is basically something very similar to Future. And uh, he was measuring the performance of different IO, uh, of different, uh, let's say, future implementations, alternative future implementations. And um, it turned out that the most basic one that is not asynchronous is the fastest one. And here are some numbers. Uh, so the, this is the not asynchronous one. So it's pretty obvious that it's a lot faster. But this is probably interesting. This is future. And this is Monique's task. And this is Scala Z. This, is, th this was measured for pure CPU computations. This is not about I.O. here. So this happens in flat map. This happens in map. This happens in a deep flat map. So it doesn't really matter how many. It, it's probably enough to do one flat map, and you're already on another thread, and you're slower, and you're losing. OK, so uh, like some rules to follow if you want to try to be fast. So. Uh, I think if, if, if you are doing some pure computation, you're creating some pure functions, try to try not to running them. Like, don't impose that it's already run in future. You can have a function from A to B, not from A to future of B. Because if you, if you already started a future, then uh, if somebody wants to do something with the result, he has to s switch to another thread. Uh, and the same applies to your, to your I don't know, interfaces. For example, most of the Scala applications are probably built in request response fashion. And most of these request response applications start with the database, right? So example, you're using some database framework. It starts with um, returning you a future, right? And then everything in your pipeline starts to return future because the, the initial one did it. So you don't have to do it. You, you can always start a future if you need it. But you don't, you don't need to return future from all the functions. So um, if it is possible, try to avoid doing asynchronous processing. It will be probably a lot faster. And if you can, you can use alternatives, like for example, task that we'll be talking about in a few seconds from Monix. Mm, OK. OK, so how to get the 
uh, how to get the most performance out of your processing. So um, we want to have as much parallelism as is possible, right? Because if we do a few things at the same time, it, thanks to the AMDO law, it will happen faster, right? You will have this uh, re computation result faster. And uh, we have limited number of calls that we can execute on. So like adding extra threads won't help because if you have a lot of threads, the system will try to reschedule you on those threads and you will be uh, slower. So, so the question uh, we can ask is, so how many threads there should be in our system, right? So this is, so we won't guess, we'll just look how it is already done in Scala in the global execution context because it, it's, it's actually working pretty well. So um, the global execution context is backed by a fork joint pool. It has its own uh, thread pool factory. And like in general, uh, the number of threads is runtime get runtime available processors. So for example, on my Mac, I have two physical cores with hyper-threading enabled, that's four. So usually my Scala programs run with on four threads if we're talking about the execution context, right? But uh, if you look at the implementation, there is something called extra threads. And uh, the default value for this is 256. And this is actually kind of like you can ask, so why if, if, if normally you have only four threads, why you might need to like 50, 50 times this, right? It doesn't make sense. So it's all about actually, uh, it's about blocking. So you pr everyone is talking that you should not block in Scala, you should not block your uh, function execution. So uh, this is also a term that is not very sharply defined. So let's, um, let's just quote the people that has the most knowledge in this area, so people, the authors of Java concurrency in practice. So algorithm is non-blocking if a failure of, uh, or suspension of any thread cannot cause failure or suspension of another thread. Okay, so I don't know if this did help you, but it didn't help me. So let's try to, I know, have some use cases. So when we are blocking, so why do you think? So when we're waiting on a log, is it blocking? Yeah, but who is waiting? The person who has the lock or the person who is waiting for the lock, right? So the person who is waiting for the lock, not the person who is holding the lock. If we're doing thread slip, are we blocking? Okay, so where's the other thread that is being blocked? Because in the definition, the, we were talking about two threads, that one is blocking the other one. I don't know. It's doing pure super long computations, but a CPU bounded, no IO here. Only CPU computation, but super extra long, like multiplying matrices. Is it blocking? No? Okay. Calling IO APIs like JDBC that is blocking by definition. Like it's blocking, right? Okay, uh, so maybe another question. So we're t we're t everyone said that lock is blocking, right? So um, in Java, you can use this compare and swap uh, functions that are that everyone says that are non-blocking, right? But if you if you try to uh, if uh, anyone everyone knows how the compare and swap works, so maybe let me just remind. So uh, the compare and swap is differs with, uh, to lock in that way that normally if you have some shared resource, you put a lock on it and everyone waits, right? Before if you release it, uh, in in the case. Uh, in the CAS case, you're trying to do something with the resource, and if somebody already is doing it, you're not being blocked, you just, the system just tells you, you didn't succeed. So for example, if you want to use CAS, you will probably do something like um, spin in while true and try to use the resource. So, um, and this is actually called non-blocking. Uh, algorithms if they use CAS. So all the atomic integers, atomic longs are using this, not locks. And uh, in that book, Java Concurrency in Practice, I found a practical example that if you have a high, highly contention environment, that means that you have a resource that is being accessed by a lot of threads at one time, then the performance of the CAS is actually lower than if you're waiting on a lock. 
So now everyone tells you that blocking is bad, but if, it's, if there are really, really a uh, high number of threads, then you might end up in a like, worse situation, right? So it's not really easy to understand what is blocking. So let's see how the Scala authors or, or the people behind future understand blocking. Um, you probably all know this, th this blocking thing, right? So uh, in Scala, if you are doing a blocking call in a future, you should uh, put it inside a blocking uh, piece. For example, if you're doing thread sleep, you should put blocking around it. But what the blocking thing actually does underneath, that's the good question. So, um, so the blocking is defined like this. So it it calls block context current block on and await permission. That is not really uh, what is, th this is not really very important. What is important is that inside, uh, inside like getting the current, the current uh, property is actually getting the current thread underneath. And what it does, it checks the current thread it, if it has a blocking context installed in it. So what does it mean that it has a blocking context installed in it? So I told you that the global context has its own thread factory, right? So this is the function taken out of the global execution context that creates the threads. So the thread is created right here, and it is marked with with block context. And inside that with block context, there is an implementation of block on that the code is not here, but it, what it does what the block on does in the implementation of block context, it adds another thread to the pool. And this is the 20, 256 additional thread that can be created. And only then, if you are doing, if you put your computation side blocking, this block on will create additional threads. If your executor is not global and is not marked with uh, block context, then the default one is used. What the default one uh, does? Well, it does nothing. It actually just runs your, your computation. So if you are using your own execution context, not the global one, it doesn't have any support for the, for the blocking thing. So if you're doing blocking, you need to do it on the global thing or you need to uh, create your own thread factory. Well, I wouldn't recommend that, probably. Um, OK, so again, the question about should we, um, because sh should we create, like I said, the block on, if we are on the global execution context, will create additional thread, right? If we put it in the block scope. So now, should the pure computation be also put in the block? Think. Should we create additional threads? If we have some long running computation? Or not? Why not? Okay, because we say not, not because uh, we believe that, but what? If you waste resources, because you do not the threads that you don't need to. Because if you have many long running kinds of computation that you use scheduled at runs, then you create yeah, exactly. That's the problem. You're already doing some kind of job, right? You're, you are doing some computation that you're interested in. So if you create additional threads, you will be context switched between them, right? So the computation will be, will be actually slower. So uh, here's another book for you for the explanation. OK. So we went through all the hopes and troubles we have with futures. So now let's see how Monix can help with those things. So what is Monix? Uh, so Monix is a library for asynchronous computation and event-based computation. It targets JVM and JavaScript. It's mostly developed by one person. That is a sad story, but this person is actually very good at respond uh, and very responsive. So I highly recommend uh, if, you, if you will try to use Monix to join the Gitter channel. Um, it, it was taken lately under the type lever umbrella projects. It has very well integration with the cats library. And this is something that is important to you. It is it, it, like, it is possible that Monix uh, 
in some near future can be used as a backend for other type level projects, for example, like Doobie and HTTP4S, because you need some kind of task thing for, for those two projects, and now they are using functional streams. Probably because of the integration with CATS, this can be like plugged in and plugged out. Um, they're slowly create, uh, creating an ecosystem around Monix. There's, for example, a Monix Kafka project, and it's, and it's actually uh, working. At least we are using it on production, so it's like production grade. Uh, what is very good about Monix, for example, if you compare it to other solutions like functional streams or Scala Z streams, is that it uh, plays w really well with the code base that is already written with the future in mind. And uh, I will try to show this uh, in a few minutes. OK, so what is task? So task is actually like an equivalent of future. So you can use it almost the same as if you would use future. But it's lazy. <coughs> so uh, again, let's define this division service that we did already in the previous slide. So we start with importing an execution context, but this one from the Monix uh, package namespace. It's actually underneath, it's using the, global, the Scala globals one. But this is uh, more performant because it, it batches your runables for performance reasons. Uh, so how to uh, use this division service? So we just put our computation inside task. It handles error for you, just like future does. Uh, but like contrary, uh, like uh, comparing with future, this is lazy. So this is not yet a running computation. You need to attach a, a callback to it. So then it starts to the, the whole computation. And. Uh, here is the scheduler that would be normally passed. So this is very similar to future, right? Uh, other way of uh, invoking task to, to start the computation is by uh, like running the run async function. So if you call the run async function, you will get something called cancelable future. So this is like a normal future that can be canceled. Uh, this actually implements the, the future traits, so you can use it everywhere you would normally use future. So that's one of the reasons that it's pretty easy to integrate Monix into your code base. And like I said, this is a normal future, so you can, uh, for example, uh, uncomplete on it. OK, uh, like uh, some other examples. So uh, for comprehension of tasks, so you have one task that that uh, computes some value, the other tasks that compute some value, some side effect that we don't care the value about, right? And we are running some, and we are adding those two arguments. So the task thing is created. Uh, it's actually the task, the, the flat map here, if you know what is trampolining, so task is trampolined underneath. I don't want to go into details. This is a way of uh, being so, like avoiding stack overflow problems without doing the rescheduling uh, with every call. So uh, the moment we call run async, so it starts this future, right? Prints this hello world, and uh, in that future we can call value, right? Like in normal future to get the result here. So this is a very, f I know, familiar line for you. Okay, so a uh, few more examples uh, from this. those are from the REPL. So uh, task now, so this allows you to create a strict, this allows you to create task from a strict value. So everything you put inside the now functions is, is executed immediately on the current thread. So if you have a value in your hand and you want to put it inside task, you should use now. And you can see that the hello is printed immediately after the, the, the thing is created, right? Um, Another function for creating task is evil. So uh, evil is actually like very similar to function zero in Scala. So it doesn't take any arguments, but it takes something that will be executed later, right? So we have this print line hello, but the creation of task uh, doesn't invoke this code yet. We need to call the run async. Uh, we need to call run async. I'm, I'm using something called run async maybe. What it does, if, if the value is there, it will return the value for you in the right. Or if the value is not yet computed, it will return a future in left. So that, that's how the run sync maybe works. Uh, another one, evil once. 
So Evil once it works, uh, it's worked the same way as Evil, but when you start it and the computation is done, it is not recomputed off on uh, further runs. So for example, if you call once for each print line, so it will print line hello and return and print 22. If you do it again, the hello is not printed uh, again, right? Another, f another method is task defer. So this is like a factory for your, for your tasks. So we have this task now inside task defer. This task now normally would execute uh, in the same time as you created it, but because of the defer, it's actually being suspended and not run yet. So this is like a, a, few, a few examples how you can use task. So as I said, uh, the task evil is like function zero, and for example, evil once is like lazy value, right? It's not computed. If it's computed, it's there. So you, you can avoid using some of the problematic, I don't know, parts of Scala, for example, lazy that can deadlock and use this one. Okay. Uh, task fork. Uh, this is this is actually something interesting. So. Monix has a fine grade control over how the computation is being uh, done. So as you probably remember, when we called task now, the value is uh, available immediately, right? On the same thread. But because we call task fork on it, we tell Monix, don't do it on the current thread, fork to another one. So this time, when I called run sync maybe, uh, even though the value is already there, right? Because task now has the value in hand. It's been scheduled to another thread, so it's not available here yet. So we got a future instead of the value in the right side. I will get back to... Um, right, here sent maybe the value was already here on the same thread, so run sync maybe returned right. And now in the case of the fork, the value is immediately available, but in another thread, and it hasn't been yet transferred to us. That's why we get a future. Uh, another good thing about task is that uh, you can bind it to some scheduler. So for example, you can create, well, Monix has a function called IO for creating schedulers for your IO things. So when you create a task somewhere, it doesn't really matter where, you can call task fork on that original task and uh, pass in the scheduler and your task will be executed on that scheduler for. Now if we uh, execute forked, it says running on the thread Scala.io from that name, right? It's not running on the global context or anything. Okay, another interesting uh, method is uh, memo memoize on success, if I remember. Somebody was actually asking about it in, in the Slack channel. Uh, so what you actually want to have is uh, you have some computation that might fail. And if it failed, you want to retry. But if you succeeded, you don't want to retry again. So here we, cr so here we have a task that is uh, calling random, right? And it's in 50%, it shows an exception. And in other 50%, it returns a two. So now we try to run this. So it failed once. We try to run it again. We, it failed second one, the second time. And on third time, it succeeded. And now we're trying to uh, run it 1,000 times. And in all the, all the uh, following uh, cases, it succeeds. And now um, some, uh, another very useful method, especially for those who are already have some code bases that is future heavy. So for example, let's say you have this run forest function. Of course, you will have uh, probably an execution context on a second parameter as implicit, right? So this is something I really don't like about futures that you need to have this implicit parameter on every method. So you can just exchange your future for a task and you can call something called the refer future action. So now, this has an implicit scheduler inside, and that scheduler is not yet passed. When the time comes, you will 
call run async and then pass the scheduler, right? So you can actually create a lazy versions of your futures by means of this function. So for example, if you already have like, some, some trait that allows you to get to the database and you, every method has this execution context, you can create a lazy version, database L, based on it only by using this task defer action. OK. OK, now uh, how to do some parallelism with uh, Monique's task. So um, we have a function that will create a task for us with a name. And uh, what it will do, it will print the current time, right? So now we're doing a monadic composition over those tasks. So we have a task one, but it's delayed 10 seconds. So that's another very useful function that you can delay the computation. You have uh, t2 that's delayed 5 seconds, and t3 that's not delayed at all. Uh, we're passing it into rep, right? We start with printing the current time at the beginning of the execution, and we run the execution. So first, this is the current time. Now the, now the, the, objects, the objects are being created. And after 10 seconds, right, you have the t1 printed, right? Now t2 after 15 seconds because of the monadic composition, right? So this is something that you would expect. Uh, and now let's try to execute this in parallel. So uh, look how, how small changes I had to do. So the full thing was just changed to zip map free. So zip, like every zip just combines uh, your free, uh, I don't know, futures or here tasks, right? So you have those three tasks. And there's a function that will uh, transform it to, to something. And now you have this starting time, right? Then you have this t3 that is immediately, because it's already there. Then you get t2, because it was scheduled five seconds after the start. And t1 after 10 seconds. OK, uh, so basically, like uh, I think that like using task can simplify your life a lot, not only in the type signatures but also in processing. And you have fine control, fine grained control over the execution. Um, okay, so the other part that is used heavily in Monix is something called an observable. So observable is actually very similar to task or future. But it allows you to, uh, to actually stream multiple values. So um, for example, a, a good use case for observable is JDBC. So if you would like to uh, express JDBC calls in terms of future on task, you need to get the whole uh, query into your RAM, right? And using observable, you can just do it like uh, one by one, row by row. So um, this is a, a small table that. Uh, if you have synchronous computation, so a single value is a future or a task. When you have multiple values that you access synchronously, you have an iterable, and asynchronous would be observable. Okay, so um, so let's look at some use cases of observable. So first, it can be used like a normal collection, right? Like a list or something. You can do a map on it, but it's lazy. So uh, the computation don't start unless you call for each run on complete, the same as in task. You need to run an observable for it to start streaming. Uh, observables can be infinite. So if you are using a stream, the Scala stream type, and you had problems with it, so observable is a good exchange for it. So here we have a usage of repeat evil function. So uh, what it does is actually calls this code inside repeat evil on every element. So if you, if you say that I want 10 elements, it will call this function 10 times and return, uh, return the result to you. So we have um, call to random next, right? We do a flat map. We can, start, we can do some computation from a future, right? So if you are using already some future-based APIs, it's all good. And it's all lazy, as I said. So to actually run this observable, we take some elements from it. Because as I said, it was infinite. So if we would run it all, it would never end, right? So we say, take 10 elements. 
and we say to list lazy. And you get a task out of it. And now, like in task, you need to attach some kind of uh, callback to it. And that's basically it. Time-based uh, usage of observable. Uh, so you can, you can ask for an observable that will uh, emit elements at some points in time, but with constant uh, distance between them. For example, emit an item every three seconds. Now you can say, OK, so I want another observable that emits the current time on every call. You can zip those two. So now you have current time and something that emits uh, every three seconds. So the second observable waits for the first one. So they go like together. So now uh, we map this observable because we don't care about this uh, tick. So we only care about the local time. We say take three because this is also infinite, right? And we say for each print line. So we want to so we want it to to print print line the result. And here we have uh, the result. Like and we, you can see that it is exchanging by three seconds, right? Twenty, twenty-three, twenty-six. Uh, like something that I, I just, just came to my mind. For example, we're using this uh, in processing of some data structures that we keep on S3, and every hour we need to update them. And this works perfectly fine. OK, uh, now parallel processing. This is a toy example of parallel processing on uh, observable. So wh what, what we are doing here, uh, and this is also an example of how blocking changes the, the execution. So uh, we are creating an observable that will get the current thread ID that when the element is computed, on which thread it is computed, right? Now we, next we say, so do it 1,000 times and map async. It's the same in ACA stream, so map it in parallel using 50, I don't know, threads, like 50 something. We, we, I will show you why this is 50 something, not, not, not that it will use 50 threads. And uh, we'll call, we'll do something like this that at the beginning of the execution, we'll increment an uh, atomic integer. We will update a list of ints that is read from how high the atomic integer is at the beginning of the computation. We will decrement it and return the thread ID. So actually, what we're trying here to, to have, uh, we're trying to have a um, atomic integer that shows how many concurrent tasks are happening at once, right? Because every task, when it's created, it increases the, the atomic integer. And when it finishes, it decreases it. Uh, and we are storing the values that we are observed in a list. This is, uh, this is of course, not totally thread safe, because you can be uh, switched off of the processor. But it's perfectly fine for, the, for this toy example. And uh, what we do at the end, so we read the all, all all of the threads IDs that we were on. This is the f this is the await result, and we also try to find how so what was the maximum value of the atomic integer? So how many tasks were actually executed? And we do it once with the blocking and once without the blocking block. Oh sorry. Uh, so uh, so the result is without blocking. So. Uh, the atomic integer was bumped up to three. So you can say that probably there was mostly, f uh, at most, three tasks executed at the same time. I mean, maybe not at the same time, that three tasks were worked on and rescheduled between the processors. And it used five different threads for it, because we got all the IDs here, right? And when we added blocking, so it used four. Uh, the, the maximum number of uh, tasks executed was four, but it used 49 threads. So probably it spent a lot of time uh, in rescheduling. So this is, this is another reason why like, pure computations shouldn't use the blocking thing. OK, uh, so now a quick example. So this, this was our broken code, right? The, the problematic code. 
So this has this dummy implementation, right? So the get client data is doing a sleep. It's, in, of course, inside a, blo a blocking block. We have an aggregate that only prints aggregate. We have seven users, right? We do this map thing. So this is exactly the same as in the, in the initial example. And now let's try to move to task, right? So this is, this is everything we need to do to move to task. Just change the signature. And here at run async, that's it. And this fixes our code. Now it will work. This is the output that you would get from running future. So you, first it would get all the data, and then it would start the processing. And in case of the task, it would get the data, process it, get the data, process it, because it is not rescheduling. Everything is happening in the same. If, if you do a series of flat map on a task, it will not reschedule. It will do all the work. At, at, at once. Uh, but this is not exactly what we want because this is like one task after another, right? And we want some degree of parallelism. We want it to happen a, a bit faster. So we need to change it a, a little bit. We need to use the observable. So this is like written with the different font. So we just put um, the list of clients uh, the user list inside an observable, and we use map async, right? So we say, okay, so just run it like free at the same time. And here's the output. It got data for free person, it processed data, it processed it, and then get again free, process free, and it finished with one because it was all that he, he was he supposed to do. Okay, that's it that I'll had for you. It took me an hour to tell all of this, so I think now we have some maybe time for questions because pizza is not here, right? Yet. So we have time for questions, if there are any. Yeah? I have a quick one. Uh, just to do your last slide, actually. Uh, you wouldn't, it, like, wouldn't it be a nice thing to actually see like the getting data and aggregation like into list? Wouldn't you want, like, if I got some of the data first, start aggregating? Like, or would it be just because you were skipping? I mean, uh, you know, actually, it, it is possible to do it. You just need to s s you just need to play with the task a little bit. For example, you can fork in a thread or something like that. So th this is doable. Like I said, in Monix, you have a really fine grade control over how the execution is carried out. Uh, are you actually? So I guess you're actually using it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sometimes obvious question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're using Monix. Uh, so the story is uh, like we've been using a lot of uh, ECA in our code base. So we're very early adopters of also ECA streams and ECA actors. So actors were fine, but like we found some problems that they're not really type safe, right? And they can get very messy. So um, streams are good. They do what they need. For example, they have this map async function, right? The problem with streams is that uh, you need to carry all this baggage, this materializer, and the streams are a lot more complicated, right? They are more powerful because you had this uh, separation of blueprint of computation and the, the materialization part, right? Monix doesn't have that, but like in most cases, you don't really need that, right? So as I sh as I shown, like if you would need if you would want to, I don't know, change your code here to be based not on futures but on streams. I think you would need to do a bit more than just change the types, right? So it's uh, like it's it's purely because of it's it's how convenient it's to, to use it, and uh, like there is this project like we're we're using a lot of we're reading a lot of data from Kafka, so there's this project Monix Kafka and it fits us perfectly fine. So, and uh, like for example, like Monix also implements the reactive streams. Uh, standards. So, for example, if you have, I don't know, if you use Sleek, right? S so you can probably connect it to Sleek without problems, right? How long do you use um, probably depends on the team, <coughs> because uh, one of the persons in uh, Atform is actually one of the maintainers of uh, Monix Kafka, so he's probably using it for let's say a year. Uh, we've been using it for like half a year here, and most of the new things that are currently written, if they are not based on Spark or something, 
we are using Monix, it, Monix there. Yeah? Uh, as you look at functional schemes too, uh, how do they compare to Monix? Why choose one or the other? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I looked in, in so into functional streams too uh, <coughs> quite a lot. So, well, actually, functional streams, uh, uh, I would say, they're really beautiful inside. The implementation is very uh, pure, but it's very hard to follow. <laughs> and uh, the problem with the functional streams too is, um, well, it doesn't play nice with all the future-based code bases, right? Because Monix, when run, it actually creates a future for you, right? In FS2, you need to base all your code on task from FS2. Yeah, it's possible. I don't. I am not saying that it's not possible. For example, there is some project that connects Akka streams to FS2 streams, right? I am not saying this is not possible. This is just like uh, more convenient. And uh, I think if you like, if you have people who are just joining, and I don't know, we're using some other tools. For example, if you have Java programmers that are joining your team and will need to write some code in Scala. So Monix is based on the the Reactive X project, right? So you have this observable, so maybe they used it also in Java, so it's also easier to, to actually understand, right? And uh, well, writing some combinators with Monix is not a problem because most of those combinators are already there. So we're joking that if you need something, then you probably already have it. As for FS2, where you have a few tools, that you can build everything yourself, and it's not always obvious how to do it. Uh, as I said, it's like a it's like a better model. It's more pure functionally written and things like that. the 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 difference is also functional streams is pool based and uh, Monix is push based, and probably in all scenarios, push based are faster. Of course, you need to, I don't know, do something with the buffering stuff, right? And uh, I mean, uh, you, you also can have some kind of uh, back pressure in Monix. It is there because like I didn't show something that is called a consumer. So a consumer actually, if you emit a, a element for this consumer, right? So it has this on next function and it has to return a completed future. So the observ so the observable need to wait for it to, to actually for the computation to finish, right? But you can put a buffer between those two, right? So you don't need to wait for, for, for the computation to finish. And then you can talk about overflows, right? If you want to overflow the buffer, like drop everything, drop head, drop tail, and, and things like that. Uh, I don't think so. I, I'm not really sure. You mean, uh, again, multiple producers? Yeah, I, I think I multiple producers as well. Ah, yeah, multiple producers is like, you, you can zip it, right? Or, or you want... One consumer. Uh, yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. Like yeah, exactly. This is, this is what you, you are doing when you do run async, right? You have one consumer. Yeah. Yeah. So you can have you, you can have two observables. You can combine them, right? You can tell it to interleave the elements, or you can combine multiple observables into one, and then you can have a consumer that you will attach, right? Then they would be like connected, right? And if I want uh, just one as, as fast as, as possible, I can just consume. No, you, you uh, this you don't need to like the the example I've shown was zip, right? And it was emitting pairs of elements. You can say that emit whatever you have. At least I think there's a combinator for this. I didn't have a need for this. Uh, I'm pretty sure there is a problem if you want to model things like in Akka streams that you, you want to somehow, I don't know, fan out, right? From observable. That's, that's probably more problematic. But like having multiple producers, I don't think that that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, would it work the same? Yeah, I think so. Like, if you want to limit the, like, 
for example, if you want to limit the, the, the concurrency level, right, the number of tasks that are being executed, you just create uh, your own pool that is somehow b bounded, right, to, to your needs. For example, Ah, uh, yeah, true, yeah, of course. But uh, like you, you, you gain f more things from it, right? Not only, like for example, if you if you actually, if anyone wants to have an exercise, so try to write uh, like s a list of lazy futures. So you have a function from nothing to future, right? And try to write a sequence that will make those futures run one after another. So there's a, a bit of a hassle to do it. So you have to do some, I don't know, tail recursive functions and things like that. And like with Monix, you get it for free because this is just how, how Monix works, right? If you need, if you, if you, for example, want it to run on another thread, that's fine, right? For example, um, I mean, like, you, you can just like call one function and say run on some other thread, right? Okay, thank you.